we have a, a new presenter, Kristen Raby Elliott. Let's just sum up to say that, that Kristen is first and foremost an educator and she knows how to convey the meaning and how to interpret whatever it is that she's presenting. So she is now the treasurer and past regent of the Francois Delary chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And then she's membership chair and past president of the Caledonian Society of New Orleans. And so what she is going to do today is to explain to us the principles of heraldry. And she's going to talk some about the Scots, the Scottish people who were here. They were very important. And I think you'll find it very interesting. It's another way of learning about a cultural identity. So Kristen, you can please begin, and okay. thank you so much for being with us. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm gonna raise the chair, because, well, it isn't gonna raise, okay. Take um, the let chair. Let me swap this chair. Take the chair. We can have like musical I'm, chairs, can't we? I feel like I'm we? sitting at a, a kitty counter. <laughs> okay, this is much better. Oh yeah, this is great. Okay, first off, um, this talk was developed by my husband. I am not an expert on heraldry, but I was around him long enough to uh, learn a lot. So this talk was developed by my husband, Michael, as you can see in the title here, for a talk on heraldry at the New Orleans Museum of Art when the National Galleries of Scotland put an exhibition there. So, heraldry. How a knight's helmet brought about a 900-year tradition. When most people hear the word heraldry, I'm sure their mind conjures up something rather old and dusty and perhaps covered with cobwebs. But heraldry is all around us and the, it affects our everyday lives. We see heraldry in the municipal shields that are on the doors of this uh, building. We see it in the seal of the state of Louisiana and of course the great seal of the United States of America. We see it when we look at our flags, such as the Louisiana state flag and the stars and stripes. Heraldry can be seen everywhere in the form of commercial signs, logos for businesses and on the computer and believe it or not, on traffic signs. But since we in the United States do not have heralds, we don't have that kind of person here, as do Britain, Canada, the Scandinavian countries, and even the Vatican has its own herald. We sometimes get heraldry wrong. When you watch the news, you might hear the newscaster talking about the latest advancement in medical science or an increase in medical insurance. On the background screen, you might see this. If you look up at the top left is what I'm talking about. This is the caduceus. It is the wand of the Greek god Hermes and the Roman god Mercury, who in mythology were the gods of commerce and communication. But you're gonna see that for the medical people. If you look at the one on the bottom right of the brown area, this is the one they should be using. This is the staff of Aesculapius. Aesculapius was the son of the Greek god Apollo and the nymph Coronis. He distinguished himself by healing the sick and wounded during the Greek and Trojan Wars. Upon his death, Aesculapius ascended to Mount Olympus and became the god of physicians and medicine. To the best of my knowledge, the only group of healthcare professionals to use the proper heraldic symbol is the emergency medical service and their trained EMTs and paramedics as shown on the right. The staff of Aesculapius is the proper heraldic symbol for all healthcare professionals. But the rest of the world does not seem to know this, especially our media. Heraldry had its beginnings nearly a thousand years ago, and it developed as most things do out of necessity. Prior to 1066 and the invasion of England by William Duke of Normandy, known as the Conqueror, and up to about 1165, during the reign of Henry II, 
Knights were dressed for battle like this. And if you look at the top knight and his helmet, with this type of helmet, other knights and foot soldiers could tell if they were following the, same, the right king or knight. They could see if it was Nagel No Nose, or Randolph Redbeard, or Eric the Evil Eye. But by the beginning of the Third Crusade in 1190, led by Richard I, Bill says it better, Cour de Lyon, the Lionheart, he and other kings and knights were armed like this, knight on the bottom. With helmets totally covering their faces, knights and the common foot soldier could not tell one king from another or one knight from another. So they could end up following the wrong one. So a system of recognition had to be developed and the job was assigned to the court herald. Every court had a herald. And that man was responsible for carrying messages and acting as an ambassador between his king and court and the other kings and courts. The system that they devised was to combine specific colors and charges, those are symbols, to be worn on the surcoat covering the knight's armor of chain mail. They would wear a tabard or a coat over the, arm, the uh, chain mail. And that would be unique to only one knight. The herald was also responsible for keeping track of these coats of arms, surcoat with the arm painted on it. And that's where we get the term coat of arms. So let me say at this point that heraldry has its own language. It's very confusing because most of the vocabulary stems from the ancient Norman French. The written description of a coat of arms is referred to as the blazoning, and if a heraldic artist is, com is commissioned to reproduce a coat of arms and the only thing available to him is the blazoning, the coat of arms can be reproduced just by the precise wording of the blazoning because the artist is going to know what the general format is going to look like. So if he's got the right words, he can reproduce a pretty authentic coat of arms. So, what has nine centuries of heraldic tradition given us? First, we're going to look at the whole shebang, the big picture, and that is what is referred to as a full achievement of a coat of arms. And I'll break it down into its various parts. And here we are. The Urquid coat of arms it dates back to the 13th, 1800s. And it's based on an ancient legend of Conachar Moore slaying a boar and his great dog who gave up his life in the battle. That made me and Glenn very sad to hear the dog died. Um, taken from the Clan Urquhart website, this is a version of the full achievement of Wilkins Fisk Urquhart II. 28th Hereditary Chief of Clan Urquhart, Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired. His grandfather, Wilkins Fisk Urquhart I, was the first American-born chief of a Scottish clan. It, Wilkins' father, Kenneth Trist Urquhart, Virginia's late husband, was the first, was the 27th chief and upon Kenneth's death in 2012, Will became chief of Clan Urquhart. So why use this one? Because this branch of the Urquhart family came to New Orleans in the late, um, from Scotland during the Spanish colonial period in 1780, somewhere in that range. So their descendants have been here ever since. So, you might have noticed streets in New Orleans and Chalmette bear their name. Meet the family. Dr. Robert Dow, who was born in Edinburgh and settled in New Orleans in 1778, became the physician at the Royal Hospital, and he married Angelica, the widow of George Urquhart that Virginia just mentioned. Her two Urquhart sons, Thomas and David, fought on the American side in the battles for New Orleans. 
After we look at the full achievement, I'll share a bit more about the Urquhart family and other groups who fought in the battles and their connection to this area and to heraldry. So looking at the coat of arms, the focal point of any coat of arms is the shield. The shape of this shield is a typical one used in Scottish heraldry and it has a gold background. The charge, which is the chosen symbol or device that helps with identification, is three boar's heads. Next comes the helm or the helmet, which in Scottish, English, and other heraldry denotes rank. You can tell the rank of a person by the helmet. In this case, it's a Scottish chief. So it is a tilting helm of steel facing three quarters right, and that is the wearer's right, not the observer's right. It's just like stage right, stage left is the opposite from the audience. Behind the helm is the mantling, that's that red and gold drapery, and originally this was based on the cloth that would hang from the back of the helmet to protect the neck. On top of the helm is a wreath, and if you were looking at it in 3D, it would be a circlet of cloth woven, and it matches the colors of the mantling. On top of the wreath is a crest coronet, that's that little crown, to denote a Scottish chief. And issuing from the crest coronet, coming up out of the crest coronet, is the crest for Clan Urquhart. In this case, it is a naked woman from the waist upwards holding a sword in her left hand and a palm sapling in her right hand. The next component is the motto. The motto is usually written in Latin. It can be placed above or below the shield, and in this case, it's a translation of Old Scots, and the motto is placed around and above the crest. It reads, speak well, mean well, and do well. Do well, mean well, speak well. The war cry or slogan is called the Cour de Guerre, and it is usually written in the common language of the people, but it is not shown on this achievement. The slogan for Clan Urquhart is trust and go forward. The next component to look at is the supporters. The supporters here are two greyhounds with collars and leashes. They can be all types of animals as well as human, and if the supporters are animals, they are usually shown standing on their hind legs as if they're holding up the shield. And so the greyhounds, the great dog of Connemore Moore, are pictured here as supporters for Clan Urquhart. Supporting the supporters is the compartment. That's the bottom part, and it's depicted as a piece of ground. It's either brown or green. In this case, it's green, and it often has a flower or a plant growing out of it that is associated with the owner of the coat of arms. In this case, it's a chiranthus, known as a wallflower. It's a flower that grows in the cracks of stone, suitable for Scottish terrain, and it has four yellow petals each. But some elements of a full achievement are not in this example of Clan Urquhart. This is a fictitious full achievement that my husband drew based on a famous group in New Orleans, and I think you can figure out what this is of. In this case, the motto is in Latin, pro bono publico, for the good of the public, and the war cry is in French, laissez le bon temps rouler, let the good times roll. If an item is hanging from the compartment, as you can see in this picture, it is an order of chivalry, and it uh, can be used when the owner of the coat of arms has been awarded an honor or is a member of an organization of charity or chivalry, such as the Knights of Columbus, one of the Masonic orders, the Knights Templars, or others. Now, the remaining components that could be in a full achievement are the manteau or robe of state. That's that huge, luscious cape that wraps around everything, and it's usually lined in ermine or some other fur. It has the mace, which are the two poles sticking out of either end, crossing behind the shield, and the crown of state. 
Now, these are only used in the heraldry of Germany, Old Prussia, Russia, and that may ring a bell as to why they use this on this coat of arms, the Grand Duke Alexis and his visit to the city of New Orleans, which sparked the creation of Rex, and some Eastern European countries. These components, the manteau or robe of state, the mace and the crown of state, are not used in Scottish, English, or Irish heraldry. So let's take a look at the shield. Every sh part of the shield has a specific name. The shield is viewed from the point of view of the person holding the shield. So what you see on the left is the right, okay? So my right would be the shield's right, or the term for right is dexter. That's letter A. My left would be the shield's left, or sinister, letter B. Remember people used to think that left-handed people were evil? In, okay, so sinister, left hand. And we'll talk more about that later because there's another meaning to it also that you're going to be surprised at. The top is called the chief, that's letter C, and the bottom is called the base, letter D. The very middle is the fess point, that's spelled F-E-S-S, -S, that's H, and below the fess point is the navel, at M. Above the fess point is the honor, that's L. See, I told you all of this gets really complicated, and you've got to study really hard to remember all this. Now, the rest of the shield is referred to in combination of these terms, and I'm not going to take the time to go through them all, but it's like middle chief, dexter chief, etc., etc., using the other terms of the partitions. Now, the shield can be divided into pieces. The lines of partition are means of dividing the shield into parts by drawing straight lines through and connecting the various points of the shield. It can be divided into two sections, three sections, four, five, six, eight, more if needed. And I'll show you an example of the if needed. It's pretty unbelievable. So it's called the listings here, the per fest, per pale, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you get down to per quarter, it shows it divided into four parts but it could be a lot more, and each part is still called a quarter, even if it's a lot more than a quarter. They don't break it down into the, uh, you know, eighths or sixteenths. They just call it all quarters. Um, there, the ones at the end are interesting, the Checky and the Garani. Uh, Clan Campbell uses the Garani on its shield in black and gold, and, um, I don't, uh, Stuart of Butte has part of, part of its shield in Czechy. Um, they're not used very often. You won't see them very often. You will see the other divisions more often. Sometimes people get a bit carried away with their ancestry. This is the shield of Lloyd of Stockton, and it has 323 quarters. Now, some heraldry scholars think this is a bit ostentatious, but others feel it offers a roadmap in one quick glance to a person's ancestry, family relations, and history. And Bill was very kind to, to scan this for me out of a book I had, and when I showed it to him, even though he said, I don't know much about heraldry, he immediately picked it up and he went, oh, this, this one's from France. Oh, he's got some Spanish ancestry here. He's got this. So he, Bill, without much knowledge of heraldry, was able to look at that and start picking out elements of this person's ancestry. So if it's a bit over the top, well, you know, some people like that. Now, from the lines of partition, we get the simplest forms that are seen on the shield. And these are referred to as ordinaries. Um, they are simple geometric figures bounded by straight lines. They run from side to side or top to bottom on the shield. And you can see the top left is the chief because that band goes across the top of the shield, which is the chief position. Now, let's look at the bend. Okay, now that bend is depicted from right top to left bottom. Remember, it's the opposite of us looking at it. 
and it's called a dexter bend, right hand bend. If your shield has a bend going from top left to bottom right, that is a sinister bend, and it means you were born on the wrong side of the blanket. So, watch out for that when you look at cross at uh, shields. The south hair that's shown here is the same is often called the Saint Andrew's cross because Saint Andrew was cru crucified on a saltier rather than a crucifix. Um, the others are uh, <coughs> labeled there. The two four borders on the bottom. The one on the left is the oral O R L E. The second one next to it is a double treasure. That's the split border there. The third one is called the escutcheon, and it because it has that plaque or escutcheon in the middle. And then the one uh, up on the right is a plain border. And bordering comes in when you're doing generational or other decorative things. Uh, borders are used in Scottish heraldry to denote differences between fathers and sons um, and other members of the same family that are granted the similar coat of arms. They, because the coat of arms would be granted to other members of the family if they petition for ownership of it, they have to make it different and somehow, and they'll use um, borders to do that. Now, a next subdivision, and again, it gets very intricate, are subordinaries, and these are geometric charges, and there's only two I really want to discuss. The first one is the lozenge, which you see is on the left third down, and the label, which is um, in the bottom middle. This diamond-shaped device is called a lozenge, and it is also the shape of the coat of arms or the shield when the owner of the coat of arms is a lady. The shield is recognized as an article of war and therefore it is appropriate for a man but not for a woman. Remember these rules were being written 900 years ago so um, you know there was kind of different viewpoint about what women could do and that proves that over 900 years ago even the heralds realize that diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> the exception to this rule is when the lady who owns the coat of arms is also chief of a Scottish clan, which is the case for Clan Elliot, the clan I married into. Our chief, Margaret Elliot, has a shield instead of a lozenge because she is chief of Clan Elliot. The label, um, that one in the bottom middle, where you see the three bars hanging down, is used on the shield of the eldest son when he is granted the same coat of arms as his father while the father is alive, since it is assumed that the eldest son will be the heir of the father's title and estates. When the father dies, the label will be removed from the shield of the son. And I'll show you even more uses of the label in a minute. Now, color. How do we get the color for heraldry? There are only five colors or tinctures, or what they called, in heraldry. Gules, red. Sable, black. Azure, blue. Purpure, purple. And verde, green. The two metals that are used in heraldry are gold, or, O-R, which is a real pain in the butt to talk about, because people think you're just saying or this or that, um, and argent. Silver, those are the two metals. So five colors, two metals, that's it. Since gold and silver paint hadn't been invented up to about 100 or so years ago, the only way to replicate the two metals was to use real gold or silver leaf. And since there was a real possibility of losing a shield, your armor, your helm, your sword, your horse and its tack, on the battlefield or on the field of honor, if you were in a tournament where winner takes all, it was way too big a risk to use the real thing. So what they did was use yellow in place of gold. So when you see yellow, it's not a color, it's a metal, and white in place of silver. So do keep that in mind. 
Yellow and white are the metals, not the tinctures. There's one exception to the above rule about tincture. Another term used in heraldry related to color is the word proper. When the word proper is used in the blazoning, it means that the heraldic artist will use the colors from nature. So for instance, if a blazoning says a stag proper, then the artist is going to paint that stag with antlers in their natural colors of tan, brown, black, and white. Another rule pertaining to color is that a tincture, a color should never be placed upon another tincture, and a metal cannot be placed touching another metal. In, uh, instead, tinctures are placed on metal, and metal is placed on tincture. But sometimes it just won't work if you want a particular thing. So. Looks will supersede the rules, as we'll see later on. Now, with the invention of the printing press, you'll notice that there are black and white versions of these up here. Uh, before colored ink was used, a device of printing heraldic colors in black and white was invented by an Italian artist by the name of Pietro Santa in 1638, and he used vertical lines and dots. And you can see on the slide there what each of the black and white symbols meant for the color. Let's see. Vertical lines are gules, horizontal lines are azure, crisscross lines are sable, right to left diagonal is vert, green, left to right diagonal is purpure, or is represented by dotted shading, and argent is blank. So that's the black and white version of the colors. Thank you, Glenn. And also on this plate is a sampling of furs that are used in heraldry. Ermine is the most used and well-known. That's the white fur with the little black tails in it. And again, fur can't be placed on fur, but fur can be placed on both color and metal. Okay? Complicated enough for you? Um, now, let's go to the fun things. Here are just a few of the flora that uh, plants and fauna that are used as charges or devices to identify of supporters in heraldry. Most important, this is where I'm going to start breaking you gently into the language of heraldry. You've already heard the colors. Now I'm going to tell you what some of the drawings mean. If you look at the red lion and the unicorn, they are rampant. That means they're standing on their hind legs, just like the greyhounds were in the uh, full achievement of the Urquhart coat of arms. If you look at the yellow lion, he is a lion gardant. That means the head is turned to face the observer. If you look at the green lion, he is a lion regardant, and he's looking back over his shoulder. The purple lion is a lion passant. He's walking. The top left lion is a lion demi, that means half, issuing from wreath. And any heraldic artist would be able to draw this using that terminology. Now, the horns, tusks, claws, hooves, Anything that is a weapon of an animal is called armed, A-R-M-E-D, and that is shown on various animals with the teeth, the claws, the hoofs, and tusks. If you look at the purple wolf, he is cooped, C-O-U-P-E-D, cut straight across the bottom. The bottom of the head and neck is a straight line. That's cooped. If you look at the boar head, the boar head is erased. That means it's a jagged edge. The bottom is torn off. The green stag that's looking straight at us is cabossed, C-A-B-O-S-S-E-D. He has a full face without a neck. Some of these animals have tongues sticking out, and it uses the French word for tongue, langue. 
And they will say langd proper, langd azure, whatever. The trio of flowers shows a scattering of something, and that's the French term seme, S-E-M-E, accent aigu. The dragon and eagle have their wings outstretched. They are displayed. And finally, a thistle proper, painted in the proper colors of nature. So if you have an occasion to read a blazoning and you are not sure of the meaning of the word, do not assume anything. Look it up. In any good dictionary, you'll have the, word, the designation H-E-R for heraldry in front of it, and that tells you the heraldic term. But if you're Googling it, just put the word you're looking at and put heraldry, and it'll give you that definition of the term. This is a tea towel that hangs above the stairwell leading from the great hall at my house. My husband designed a great hall and decorated it with heraldry. I have heraldry everywhere in my house. And this is a tea towel he framed to go with the decor. It shows some of the animals associated with the royal families or countries and areas in the UK. Um, the one on the top right is the Yale, and I have no idea what that is supposed to be but I guess I could look it up and find out. Now, helms, hats, and crowns. The helm is very, very important because it denotes the rank. Gold full-faced at the top left with the visor closed indicates a king. Only a king can have that on their shield or charge. Uh, the steel full-faced with the visor open indicates a knight, that's at the middle. The silver with a gold visor closed and facing three quarters indicates a peer of the realm, a duke or an earl. A tilting helm, steel and facing three quarters, identifies a Scottish baron or chief, as you saw on uh, Kenneth's full achievement, or Will's full achievement. And a steel helmet closed in profile indicates the owner of the coat of arms is a gentleman but he does not have a title. Shown here in the um, left is an imperial crown. It's left of the red hat, and it has a purple chapeau or a hat inside of it, and that's only for imperial royalty, the royal family, or the king, queen, whatever. On the other side of the red hat is a coronet of a peer of the realm, and it's worn over the red chapeau that you see in the middle. If the chapeau is red, it indicates a gentleman who owns lands and estates. If he is a gentleman without lands and estates, the chapeau is blue. All of this really means something, and you better not get it wrong. If you give a red chapeau to somebody without lands and title, the people with lands and title are going to get very angry at you. So um, the bottom left is a crest coronet, as we've already seen. And it's sometimes used instead of a wreath on top of the helm. And I'll talk about that when we get back to the uh, uh, irk at full achievement. While the bottom right is the Prince of Wales coronet. So the Prince of Wales actually has his own coronet. And finally, at the bottom center is a helmet from the Third Crusade era, and it shows you the ori original mantle, wreath, and crest, the sword coming out of the top of the helm. I pointed out in the beginning a mistake that's commonly made in regard to uh, medical professions and the use of the wrong heraldic charge. Now I'm going to do it again, and this may upset you. And if it does, I'm sorry, but this is life. You can go to almost any shopping mall or to a Highland Games, and you're going to see a booth, a tent, a card, or a counter, and it will display a sign that says, let us find your family coat of arms. And you very willingly plunk down a lot of money, and they give you a coat of arms. Guess what? There is no such thing. Period. Just because you paid somebody money you don't have a coat of arms. It doesn't belong to you. In the United Kingdom, the Lord Lion King of Arms of Scotland and the Earl Marshal and the 13 heraldries at the Royal College of Arms in London are the only ones who can grant a coat of arms to an individual petitioner, not to anyone who happens to have the same name as the petitioner. 
Each European nation has its own official method of granting arms. So, unless you have one of these, you do not, an official grant of arms from the Lord Lyons Court of Scotland, you do not have a coat of arms. This is the proclamation from the Lord Lion King of Arms granting Kenneth Trist Urquhart of Urquhart the armorial bearings of Urquhart to him and his stated successors. It contains a drawing of the full achievement and the other items he is entitled to, including a badge, a standard, and a pin cell. That's the little triangular flag at the bottom left. The description and blazoning for all of them is also given in this proclamation. And this is the only way you get it a coat of arms. Now, let's look at how a coat of arms works in the same family. My husband drew this for, with the Elliot shield. The top drawing is the shield from the coat of arms of the late Sir Arthur Elliot of Stobbs, chief of Clan Urquhart, Margaret's father. So let's say for demonstration purposes that Sir Arthur had three sons and a daughter. He didn't, he only had a daughter, but we're just gonna pretend so that we can illustrate this. And I have to go with this because this is what Michael drew and I can't draw these things. So, you'll notice the top shield is Sir Arthur and then it shows he has three sons and a daughter because there's three shields and a lozenge. And they have various types of the charges of the bar, Dexter, on the coat of arms. The first son gets the label. That means he's the oldest son. The second son gets a yellow border with a gold background instead of, uh, with a, I'm sorry, a yellow border around it. And then the third son gets a green border around it. The daughter gets the lozenge with a bow on top. Okay, the first son has three sons. So his first son gets a label with five hangy down things. The second son gets a slightly different one. The third son gets a slightly different one. The second son has two sons, so he gets a label with, I think, seven hangy down things, and the second son gets the yellow border with something else on it. The grandson has a son, so he gets the shield with the label on it, with more hangy down things, and the second and third great-grandson get more labels and so forth, and it just goes on down. So all of this is done if the chief is alive and he has all of these descendants who are alive. Once the chief dies, it all bumps up one and they all get changed. So also included um, on these are what are called cadency marks. And those are other ch charges placed on the shield to show birth order. And believe it or not, they have a chart of cadency mar marks that go out to the 16th daughter and the 16th son, and every one of those marks means something as to birth order. So again, it's insanely confusing, but it's the Lord Lion's job to figure it out, not yours. You don't have to worry about it. They know what to do. Okay, now at the bottom, we have the marriage of two families. On the left is the shield of Scott of Buccleuch. And the owner of this shield marries into the Elliott family. The two bottom ones show the shields joined. The left one means a male Elliot married a female of Scott of Bucluth who owned the coat of arms. She would have had a lozenge, but on his shield, of course, it's gonna be the shape of a shield. On the right, a female Elliot married a male Scott of Bucluth. And because she's female, she can join the two together, but it has to be in the shape of a lozenge. If you uh, notice when uh, Prince William became engaged to Kate Middleton. The Middleton family applied for a coat of arms and received it. Kate applied for the coat of arms as the daughter and Will, Prince William joined her coat of arms to his to show a union coat of arms. And it had Kate's coat of arms in half with the royal coat of arms that Will 
William, uh, Prince William owns. Okay, now, this is taken from the Urquhart Ensign's Armorial uh, and that Virginia gave me to photograph. And at the time of the printing of this, it, it, was, it had a whole bunch more on it. I only used the first two. But at the time of this printing, Kenneth was still alive. And the coat of arms on the left shows him as chief of Clan Urquhart, while the one on the right shows that he has a son who has been granted the coat of arms, but with labeling. And that's the blue that's on uh, Will's coat of arms. And he is listed as the younger because Kenneth's father had the same name as him. So Wilkins is listed as the younger Wilkins Fisk Urquhart, and he has the labeling there. Of course, when Kenneth passed away, the labeling was removed, and uh, Will now has the uh, coat of arms. Those of us who have Scottish ancestry and belong to a clan society can display our chief's crest shown inside of a belt with his or her motto emblazed on the belt. The strap and buckle indicates that the wearer is merely displaying the chief's crest. You can't say it's yours, okay? Um, the belted crest can be displayed in any tasteful form we wish, such as a cap badge or on stationery or business cards or even shirts and t-shirts with the belted crest on the front or the back. And these are some samples of belted crest. Clan Urquhart on the left. Um, clan Donachy, which is uh, also known as Clan Robertson, which is my clan, my mother was a Robertson, and Clan Elliot on the top right. Any recognized member of a clan can display them, but they are forewarned it is at the chief's discretion. And some clans are very touchy about you using it and can even fine you in some cases if you use it erroneously or try to claim it for your own. So beware. If you've been to any Highland Games or the Renaissance Festival, you may have noticed some shields on display on tents or on the grounds. And technically, those shields belong to the chief of the clan. You cannot claim it as yours, as belonging to the family or the person displaying them. As long as that is understood, it's no problem about displaying the shields out of respect to your chief. Just don't claim it as your own unless you've been granted a proclamation by the Lord Lion Chief of Arms. Here's another tea towel in my great hall. We are covered with heraldry. And it uh, depicts the, uh, uh, it shows the arms of some of the many chiefs of Scottish clans. There's like 270 of them. There's a lot of Scottish clans and families. And note that these are reproduced with the permission of the Council of Scottish Chiefs. Every chief of a Scottish clan belongs to the Council of Scottish Chiefs, and they meet and issue decrees and do various things uh, for the clans. And it is sanctioned by the Lord Lion King of Arms. So whoever printed this had to get permission from Lord Lion King of Arms to reproduce these. And they are depicted as the uh, shields of the chiefs of the Scottish clans. Now, I promised you more on the history of the Urquhart family in New Orleans, and again, thank you, Virginia, for all of this, and thanks to Bill for finding these excellent paintings in one of his books. These are the portraits of some people important to the Urquhart family in New Orleans, and a picture of a house you may have heard of. Meet Angelica Monsanto Urquhart Dow. She is widow of George Urquhart and mother of Thomas and David, who fought in the Battle of New Orleans. And that painting is by the famous artist Salazar. Dr. Robert Dow was the second husband to Angelica, and his painting is also by Salazar. And both of these are very prominent Scots in New Orleans. The sons, Thomas and David, Tur Thomas Urquhart on the left, became speaker of the Louisiana House of Representatives, and he signed the original Constitution for the state of Louisiana, the one that was in French. And next to him is his brother, David Urquhart. This is a, uh, from a pastel portrait done in Paris in the 1830s. And I photographed that at Virginia's house. It is still hanging at her house. And my brother Glenn did some very creative Photoshopping to uh, get it usable. 
So thanks, Glenn. Now, this is Chateau des Fleurs. It was built by David Urquhart as a summer house in present day Araby on what eventually became Angela Street, named for his mother, Angelica. If you wondered why we say Angela Street instead of Angela, you just met her. Um, that house later became the home, after a couple of sales, to Mrs. Anita Momus Merrow. And it was the childhood home of Joseph Momus Merrow until it burned in 1939 and they moved up to Audubon Place. So how's that for a connection to St. Bernard Parish? So, now, are you ready for a little bit audience participation? You have been talked at all this time. So let's let you talk a little bit and see how much you remember of all of this voluminous information I've thrown at you. Um, I found a box of heraldry bits and pieces under my late husband's desk when I was cleaning up his office and get, getting rid of the big, huge desk. And lo and behold, he had done cutouts of all of the pieces of the Urquhart full achievement that he had given a long time ago. Jason Brown, Nunez's director of communications, very kindly photographed them for me, and we built them from the bottom up on a wall in the library at Nunez. So we're going to construct the Urquhart full achievement using proper heraldic language, and let's see how good your memory is. So in this slide, we have the bottom. Anybody remember what it's called? Compart compartment? Okay, it's a compartment, and it can be either brown or green, and in this case, it's green. Um, and it is embellished with a certain kind of flower, something we don't, we call ladies who aren't very forthcoming, a wall flower, very good. And they have four petals of yellow. On the shield, it's, Boar's heads, do you remember what the bottom is called? It's been torn off, erased. And the color? The color of the boar's heads? Gules, Very, somebody got it great, gules, red. Uh, the shield is? Or? Excellent, y'all are great. Now, the boar is armed Proper, that means what? It's, t it's tusks are white, but it's langed azure. What's, what says your? The tongue. Very good. Y'all are great. Okay, now we added the supporters. Okay, and they are two greyhounds proper because they're the natural color, right? Now, they have, they are collared what color? Gules, we've said it already. And they have leashes reflexed over their back and the color? Or, very good. Next comes the helm, mantling, and wreath. The blazoning says, helm befitting, befitting his degree. Now, any artist, the heraldic artist, is going to know he's a Scottish chief. So he gets a tilting helm facing which direction? Three quarters right. Very good. Yay, y'all listened. I'm so proud of you. Now, there is, uh, oh, the mantling is what colors? Gules and or because you can't have color touching color, so it's gotta be a metal and a color. Very good. And there is no mention of a wreath in the full achievement blazoning. However, it's on this version of the Urquhart full coat of arms, the full achievement. So the wreath is the same color as the mantling. All right, and then next we have 
the crest, okay? The naked lady. Everybody remembers the naked lady, okay? And this is the crest. It's issuant from a crest. What's the little crown? The little baby crown? Coronet, very good. A naked, uh, and what color is the coronet? Or a naked woman from the waist upwards and she's colored how? No, look at her. Proper, very good. Brandishing in her left, which is dex, uh, no, right, brandishing in her right hand, Dexter hand, a sword, and what color is the sword? Azure. It's hilted and pommeled another color. No, look at it. It's gules. Very good. Red. And she's holding in her sinister, which is her left hand, a palm sapling. And what color is it? Vert. And finally, we have the motto. It's an S scroll. That means the little scrolly thing. Over the same, which is the crest, the motto speak, says, and y'all can read it, mean, well, speak well, and do well. Congratulations, well done. <laughs> now, another group of heraldry you might have observed at Los Isleños Museum Complex are the settlers of the Canary Islanders. And they founded St. Bernard in the late 1700s, and they fought in the Galvez Expedition, and they fought in the Battle of New Orleans. This is the banner on display at the museum. In the banner, we see the shield with seven mounds, and that symbolizes the seven inhabited islands, right? I did get that right. And the, it, the supporters are the famous Bardino Maharero dogs, which arrived in the islands with the indigenous people from North Africa, the ancient Berbers. And through breeding with the English Mastiff, the breed is now called the Presa Canario. It was from these dogs, not birds, that the Canary Islands got their name. Remember that Canis is Latin for dog. And that's why they're the Canary Islanders, because of these beautiful dogs. At the top, um, on the right-hand side is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, at the top of, is the Imperial Crown of Spain, because they were part of Spain. And the motto, Oceano, on the escrow, escrow uh, is for the location of the islands, because they're located in the ocean. The plaque on the right is for Gran Canaria, and it shows the castle of Castile, the Lion of Leon, and the famous dogs, and the palm of the Canary Islands. So these are two bits of heraldry that relate to the Canary Islands and the Canary Islanders who came here and figured so greatly in the history of St. Bernard Parish. Bill found for me the full achievement of Bernardo de Galvez. This coat of arms was awarded to Governor Galvez by King Carlos III of Spain. The ship that's in the coat of arms is an image of the Galvez town, the vessel which led the assault on Fort Charlotte in Pensacola. And it was then that he created his famous motto, and I'm going to let Bill say it because it's sounds... Yo solo. Yo solo. I alone. And that became his motto. He was born in Spain in 1746, died as Viceroy of New Spain in Mexico City in 1786, and the parish of St. Bernard is named in his honor, and that is his full achievement. So now that you've gotten familiar with the language and rules of heraldry, heraldry let's see how this ancient form of communication carried out in the battles for New Orleans. First and foremost, flags are a part of heraldry, and just as a coat of arms identifies different groups, a flag and banner can identify nations. Uh, here are two main national flags from the conflict. You may not have ever really noticed this version of the American flag. Um, from the very beginning, the United States flag broke the heraldic rules because we wanted to have the stripes alternate. And yes, they do alternate metal and tincture, but the stripes come up against the ensign or field, and that is tincture touching tincture. 
So it broke the rules from the very beginning, but it's probably likely that they didn't even know heraldry anyway, but if they did, we decided to go for looks because it would have looked ridiculous to put silver at the end of the red stripes and then it would still break the rules because it would still be touching the other um, silver bars. So we went for looks. Now, this flag has 15 stars and 15 stripes, even though in 1812 we had 18 states because Louisiana became the 18th state. They hadn't caught the flag up yet. So this is the flag that we used at the Battle of New Orleans, even though the three states that came in um, after the original 13 colonies, um, I mean, after the fifth, this flag was designed, aren't pictured here. The, uh, this flag was updated in 1818, and they realized that the number of stripes was going to get out of hand if they did a stripe for every state. So they solidified the number of stripes at 13 for the original colonies and that the pattern of stars would change as each state was admitted. And when it was updated in 1818, they added five more uh, states to the original um, 13 colonies. So now, you will notice that the flag of the United Kingdom is heraldically correct. They knew better. And I won't trouble you with the blazoning because it is unbelievably complicated. Believe it or not, this flag is quartered. And I don't, the blazing is ridiculous. But anyway, as mentioned in the slide, you can see um, from the description up here that um, the patron saints of England, Scotland, and North Ireland are pictured on the flag. Wales, at the time of this design of the flag in 1818, which is when they joined North Ireland to England, Wales is not represented. Its saint is St. David, which is a gold cross on a black field. Wales is not represented, not represented because it was considered under the domain of England at the time. So. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion in Parliament about how to remedy this. Wales has suggested one of two things. One is to put the passant Gules Welsh dragon on a silver field in a rectangle at the very middle of the cross of St. George, the middle of the flag, which would give them total preeminence over everybody else. Um, that was rejected as ridiculous. The other suggestion was to change the white background of the cross of St. George, again, that's the vertical and horizontal bars, to the yellow ore of St. David. And again, it really looks ugly. And that was dismissed. Um, either one of those would violate heraldic rules. So um, I doubt that either one of those is going to happen, and Wales is going to continue to not be represented. All right, now we're going to get down. Since this talk emphasizes Scottish heraldry, we're going to conclude with the most important British group in the battles of New Orleans. It is only fitting that we conclude by examining the heraldry related to the 93rd Sutherland Highland Regiment of Foot. As most of you know, this regiment suffered the highest casualties in the 5th battle for New Orleans on the morning of January 8th, 1815, due to their heroic adherence to orders. And here they are. The following is taken from their website. For this expedition, the 93rds were ordered to wear tartan trousers, trues, instead of their kilt, and hummel bonnets in place of the feather bonnet. No other Highland units were in this division, and as the only Highland, as only Highland regiments wore the kilt, it is obvious, despite what you see from Hollywood, from drawings, from anything else, there were no kilted soldiers involved in the New Orleans campaign. Even Andrew Jackson's biographer called them kilted soldiers. They weren't. They were in trousers, because it was freaking cold. <laughs> on a historical note, this is not on their website, it was the only time the 93rds went into battle without a kilt, and it was their only loss. 
So after the Battle of New Orleans, they passed a regimental law that they would never again go into battle without their kilts. That's how important it was. So again from their website, on January 8th, the main body of the 93rd, some 960 men, moved up in the column along the river road on the British left to reinforce where needed, originally to help take the advanced US redoubt by the river, which was accomplished. They actually took the redoubt, but it lacked support and faltered. But then the British right faltered. US cannon fire from the West Bank was continued, and so the 93rd, with pipes playing Money Musk, the regimental charge, was ordered to cross the field diagonally to assist the right flank. 100 yards from the parapet from Line Jackson, Commander Colonel Dale ordered a halt, and no one knows why, whether it was to uh, begin forming an attack column or to ascertain the situation they were in, will never be known because he was shot through the head. The 93rd had been ordered to halt, and halt they did, and they stood in parade formation 100 yards from the Tennessee and Kentucky rifles. He was killed immediately. General Keene was also down, as was General Gibbs. Many more 93rd officers fell. Pakenham rode forward to rally his army and died not far from the 93rd, having previously called out, have a little patience, 93rd, and you shall have your revenge. The regiment had no further orders and so stood. Firm and immovable as a brick wall, as one American observer was to write, other British units broke and ran all around them. General Lambert, having taken command, and seeing the 93rd standing their ground alone in the murderous artillery fire, sent orders to the regiment to withdraw. So the 93rd came back in parade ground formation, precision, suffering between 300 to 500 casualties. Three quarters of the regiment's force and one fourth of the total British casualties. The immense bravery shown by the 93rds in this advance was noted by the American Paul Wellman, General Andrew Jackson's biographer, and he wrote, to the very edge of the canal before the rampart, the few that were left of the kilted regiment marched, then halted there. The men who had been detailed to bring scaling ladders and fascines had failed to come up. Unable to go forward, too proud to retreat, the magnif uh, uh, although the regiment behind them had all fallen back, at length, a mere handful of what had been the magnificent regiment slowly retired, still in unbroken order, still turning to face the foe. From the ramparts, the Americans cheered them wildly. All rifle fire ceased. That is how brave the 93rds were. So the next time you visit the battlefield or the reenactment field, stop for a moment and think of all those who came before to create the history of this time and this place. Because of a 900-year-old tradition, we can see the past in the present. In examining their heraldry, we can learn who these people in groups were and what their accomplishments were and how their lives continue to be linked to ours. Thank you for being such a good audience, and I'm gonna conclude with this last page, which I hope does not need an explanation. <laughs> As I said in the introduction, heraldry can be seen everywhere in the forms of commercial signs, logos for businesses, and on the computer, and believe it or not, traffic signs. Now you know how it all came about. Thank you.
and thank you for your patience.